I'm going to get us started by really in like welcoming you all online to this virtual seminar with Projit Bihari Mukherjee, who I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you today. Uh, I'm a big fan of Projit's work, uh, which is partly why, of course, uh, in addition to the fact that he's uh, extremely well known uh, in, in having him here today as part of a series that we've been organizing on the history of public health in India, which was prompted by the COVID outbreak, but of course extends uh, far beyond and, uh, and you know, hopefully also kind of allowing us to see how history influences the way that we think about health today. So Projit completed his PhD at SOAS in London after an MPhil and an MA at JNU in Delhi, which is where he is now again as a professor of history at Ashoka University after many years at uh, UPenn. So Projit's first book, which is the one that I read and was completely blown away by, was called Nationalizing the Body. And it talks about South Asian doctors and medical subordinates who were employed in the colonial medical establishment, particularly in Bengal in British India and their creativity in vernacularizing Western medicine uh, to really face the local realities of the time. His second book, Doctoring Traditions, is about Ayurveda and about how it modernized under colonialism, again focusing on the agency and creativity of the Ayurvedic physicians. And finally, um, the book that Projit will be speaking to us about Today, his new monograph, uh, recently released by Chicago University Press, Brown Skins, White Coats, Race, Science in India. And in addition to these incredible standalone monographs, I'm always stunned at Projet's wide ranging interests, which include football and also um, detectives and forensics. I had a nine year old who uh, dressed up as a detective for Halloween this year. And I was looking at some of your articles around handwriting analysis as a, as a you know detective tool and detective dynasties. And of course, also your work on watches and temperatures Culture. So in addition to being a real authority on the history of science, the history of medicine within, but pushing forward the subaltern study school project also comes together, um, comes to us with this interest uh, in forensics, which I understand is going to develop uh, going forward. But with further, with no further ado, I want to turn it over to Projit to welcome him, to thank him for being here today, and to all of you for joining us. And to those of you who will be watching this recording, thanks for doing that as well, Projit. Thank you very much, Prerna. Thank you for having me here. Um, and thanks also to Grace and Stephanie for organizing this. Um, and thanks to all of you uh, for joining us at what is, I guess, 10 o'clock for you guys. Uh, it's, it's 10 o'clock on a holiday. So actually, this is a real, um, it's it's a real kind of show of, of real commitment to the topic. So 10 a.m. on a holiday and 8.30 p.m. on a Friday night in India. So these are the, these are the true kind of vanguard. Absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, um, and thank you for the generous introduction. But I, I kept being just jealous about like you having a nine-year-old because my three-year-old won't let me read anything any longer uh, so um okay let's um let's get started and as brainer said uh, this is a new book i've not seen it in actual hard copy print yet i'm gonna see it next week uh, inshallah so so um and what I plan to do today is give you a little bit of a sense of what the book is about um, in general, and then dive into one of the chapters a little bit. Uh, that's more to do with health. The rest of it is more tangentially, it's more about genetics. And then there's uh, bits of it, which is about health, which I'm gonna um, get to. So let me see if I'm able to share my screen. I should be. So hopefully everybody can see my screen now uh, my slides okay um okay i'm trying to get this to be right okay great so uh, my book is called brown skins white coats uh race science in india 1920 to 66 which is of course a shout out to france fanon 
Um, and um, if you're interested in how I get into Fano, I can tell you later, uh, or how what's the Fano connection, but Fano is all over the book. So um, I can, I'll be happy to talk about it. Generally speaking, uh, and this is the cover of the book. And so generally speaking, uh, my uh, argument in the book is roughly that genetics um, has led to the rebiologization of social differences. By social differences, I mean caste, religion, et cetera. Uh, groupings that we thought had nothing to do with biology um, uh, and which in the 19th century when they were racialized were, uh, or, or were biologized that we recognize to be uh, race science. But we think somehow that science has progressed since the 19th century that we have done away with this kind of racial uh, basis for human difference. Um, and there is now increasingly a lot of work mostly on the West, but also just, uh, we're just beginning to see some works outside the West as well. For instance, Elise Burton has a wonderful book on, um, on genetics and nationalism in the Middle East, looking at mainly Iran, Turkey, and Israel. Um, uh, but this is a story that's unfolding of how uh, genetics has revived a kind of um, racialized idea of human differences. Um, and so my book is essentially doing that for India, uh, looking at how the rise of genetics in the wake of the First World War and bringing the story up to, I don't bring it up to the present, I stop in 1966, which is of course when uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri dies. And so it's a kind of, um, it's a good cutoff point in many ways. And if you're interested in why I chose that cutoff point, I can, I can tell you more about it. So what's the book? Uh, what do the chapters look like? Well, uh, I've got these um, seven chapters, essentially. The first one where I talk of the rise of this kind of what was then called seroanthropology. So what happens is genetics comes out of uh, a study of blood groups and blood groups are discovered very early in the 1900s. Uh, the knowledge about them gets fine tuned during the first world war due to the requirement for blood transfusions for soldiers. And actually it is in one of the theaters of the first world war in Greece, where uh, uh, a Polish Jewish husband, wife, doctor and nurse couple develop something else called seroanthropology. And this seroanthropology is going to become gene human genetics in the long run. What they did was because they were sitting in Greece and like with most of the first world war, you know, there's uh, uh, a lot of troops are gathered, but there's not that much action for most of the times. People are just holed up in their bunkers. Um, and what these guys, um, uh, Hirsch, uh, Ludwig and Hannah Hirschfeld do is they go around looking at British and French imperial troops, including Indian troops. They're taking their blood groups and trying to see if there's, a, uh, if there's any kind of correlation between the frequency with which any one blood group appears and the racial designation. Of course, they come up with their own racial designation. So Indians are one race, um, Vietnamese are another race. So it's not your traditional five race theory, but it's this kind of racial formation starts to take shape. Uh, after the First World War, this sort of completely skyrockets, ex it grows exponentially. Uh, according to one uh, scholar who tried to compute statistics for only England, America, and France, there were about 3,000 studies of this nature done just in the interwar years, but that only takes into account studies done in France, um, England, and the US. Um, so I look at what happens to seroanthropological research in India, which takes off very quickly, and how it gets like, um, th its main jumping off point is criticizing the Hirschfelds for calling the whole of the subcontinental population a single race, and saying, no, no, we are made up of many races, and then trying to break it down. And, um, and that eventually leads to the formation uh, just at the moment of uh, decolonization in 19, in November, 1946. So the, just months away from uh, formal independence for India and Pakistan, um, we see the formation in India of something called the Anthropological Survey of India, um, which remains a sort of somewhat strange, neither uh, fish nor fowl kind of an institution till this date. Um, 
it's a government department. It's not a university department. It's a government department, uh, but that employs by the 1930s, the Indian Anthropological Society uh, survey was the biggest single global employer of people trained in anthropology anywhere. So it's a, it's a strange thing. When we think of histories of anthropology, we think of university departments. We don't think of things like the ASI. And in India, when we think of the ASI, we think it's a colonial institution. It's not. It's founded by Indians in November 1946. And it is also um, overwhelmingly, if you look at what uh, the ASI has done, it's overwhelmingly done research in physical anthropology with extremely uh, what I consider racialized assumptions baked into it. And this carries on till this date. Anyway, so the first chapter and the introduction gives you this broad landscape. Uh, the second chapter then looks at how religion, something that uh, we think is clearly not biological. People are Hindus or Muslims or Christians or Jews because of their faith or belief. But no, there is an increasing argument that no, once they... Uh, belong to a particular religion, they only marry amongst themselves, they become a segregated gene pool, and therefore particular types of um, biological distinctiveness arise. So uh, in this chapter, I look mostly at um, Indian Jews and to a lesser extent at some Indian Muslim communities. Um, the third chapter, A Taste for Race, uh, looks at another dimension of this uh, genetic racialization where people tried to see whether different castes had uh, tasted the, um, and by taste, I literally mean the thing you feel on your tongue. So uh, bitterness was a kind of trace taste that was developed, a certain chemical was developed, which some people could taste and some people couldn't. And there was an argument that went on being made in India that particular castes have a greater uh, capacity to taste bitter than others. And so this became another way of like solidifying. So taste to me seems interesting because it's such a ephemeral sense, unlike say our visual sense or even our auditory sense, it seems like very um, ephemeral fleeting, but it gets like racialized and made into this uh, kind of biological object in an interesting way that reinforces all kinds of assumptions about the social divisions of um, South Asian society. Uh, the fourth chapter is about malaria. This is the chapter I'm gonna to talk to you in greater detail in, in much of the rest of the talk. So I will skip it here. Um, the fifth one, uh, blood multiple, looks at the actual practices of whose blood was collected, how was it tested, what kind of reagents were used, etc. cetera. Um, then the sixth one looks at, sixth chapter looks at, uh, communities, because a disproportionate number of uh, marginalized communities, communities that were far away from a social and geographic centrality uh, were tested and many of them refused to give blood. This was often coded as uh, these communities being superstitious, anti-science, etc. Uh, but I try to explore in this chapter, why did they refuse to give blood? What were the kind of, um, uh, and I, I use refusal uh, as uh, alternative to the traditional framing as resistance. Um, and because I think that refusal and anthropologists have been working on this, of course, uh, the, who and they have suggested that refusal is better at locating moments of uh, friction within the cosmological paradigms uh, that um, they're grounded in. Finally, the seventh chapter or racing the future, I look at why did these geneticists actually indulge in what I'm calling race science? What were the kind of futures they looked at? Uh, we often feel that Science is uh, based on hard facts. There's no scope for speculation. Speculation is something that fiction does. Uh, but scientists always have a notion of the future. There's something they want to achieve because of which they're doing it. And I wanted to bring out that speculative, future-oriented aspect of science. And I look at some of the leading characters in my book in this last chapter to see what kind of futures drove them to do the work they were doing. There is also, apart from the conclusion, uh, where I return to Fano, um, there are also what I call interchapters. Uh, these are things I'm um, that are sort of a little more experimental uh, in that they're not exactly um, 
the kind of writing you get in a historical monograph. They're, uh, they're written as letters, letters exchanged between the author and the principal character of a um, dystopian science fiction novel written by a Bengali author in the 1930s. What interested me was that this author was writing a science fiction novel in the 30s in the same city where many of these uh, geneticists were working. Um, and he was working also with ideas of race, futurity, science, uh, etc., and came to very different conclusions. Um, but we usually dismiss this as pulp fiction, as speculative, etc. But I thought that uh, the, the novel had the capacity of bringing into relief some of the moral and political tensions uh, that the scientists in their terse, very brief publications always eschew. So the interchapters are both draw on fiction and I further fictionalized it by making it a series of uh, epistolary exchanges between the author and the character uh, in the novel, but hopefully they, st uh, they play a function in showing exactly what is not easily visible in the science. And I kind of, there is a, another argument about alienation, the draws and fanon that I make above the interchapters in the conclusion. And I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A if anyone's so interested. Anyway, let me dive into medicalizing race, the chapter that I want to talk to you about today. Um, and essentially, if I have to give you an elevator pitch for what the chapter is, it's that medicine is both the rationale and the site for rebiologization. Hopefully this will become clear through the chapter. But what I'm trying to say is that medicine is both used as an excuse for this new uh, racialization of uh, South Asian communities, as well as it is the site on which this racialization and, or rebiologization is happening. So it is, my story is about sickle cell and malaria. So let me, uh, let me start by giving you a sort of a potted, mostly American history of sickle cell anemia before I bring it back to India. Now, there's a ton of literature on sickle cell and anemia in the US context, not only by historians, but a whole host of social scientists have written about it because sickle cell is the, as one, um, one historian, Keith Welu, uh, put it, it is a cultural icon. It is no longer a disease. It is a cultural icon that's become so integral to the history of 20th century African-American politics uh, and uh, its politics of liberation that it, it you, you can't just treat it as a disease in the US context anymore. Anyway, so um, to give you a potted history of this disease, it was first detected in 1910, even though it was not named as such at that point uh, by James B. Herrick. Uh, and when he found what he said were peculiar elongated and sickle shaped red blood corpuscles in an African-American patient with severe anemia. And you can see a visual here that shows you the difference between what you see under a microscope, um, usually what red blood corpuscles look like, they're round donut shaped things and in sickle cell, um, in, uh, in kind of sickle cell cases, you see this very different shape. I don't know why it's called a sickle though. It doesn't like, it doesn't look like a sickle to me, but um, anyway, it got called sickle cell anemia. Uh, subsequently, Vern Mason and John Huck, two other scientists, uh, distinguished a latent stage of it. So it could be, they found that this kind of sickle cell could exist even in um, patients who weren't suffering from anemia. And that was a latent stage, but sometimes these patients would have children who would have this serious and debilitating anemia that often uh, in extreme cases also led to death. Um, Mason and Huck's uh, research also established a racial basis to the disease, arguing that it was always and only available in uh, the blood of African Americans. This then, by the 1920s, start uh, becoming used as a rationale for Jim Crow for segregation. Um, American segregationists start arguing that um, because a latent stage exists, you can't always physically tell if a person is ill or not, but because African Americans carry this, these cells, if the intermarriage is allowed with uh, white men and women, 
they could have children that would allow this, uh, they weren't yet calling it gene, but they can, <laughs> this trait could pass into the white population and therefore intermarriage should be stopped, should be policed, perfect segregation should be um, uh, observed, etc. So this was happening by the 1920s as Duana Fulwili, uh, one of the uh, social scientists write on this, um, says that by the 1920s, it was all too clearly, it had become an all too reliable weather vane for the climate of racial thinking in the US. And this would continue into the 1940s. But from the 40s, it, this begins to change. And it begins to change because of two scientists who would later get the Nobel Prize for this, Linus Pauling and J.V. Neal. Uh, they first determined that it was not, they developed a new test, something called electrophoresis, which displaced the earlier, very, what now looks like a very primitive test if you basically uh, took a sample of blood and you treated it in certain ways and then observed it under a microscope and that was it. They displaced that for something called electrophoresis, which was incredibly useful in developing ideas about uh, DNA and genetics later on. But what this did was also showed that uh, eventually the reason these cells looked different, the sickle cell didn't look like a donut, was because the hemoglobin molecule uh, was differently shaped. It had, uh, it was a so-called aberrant molecule. It did not look like the usual uh, molecule and therefore all the molecules stacked up differently, giving the whole cell a different shape. Now, uh, historian Suraya the Chadaravian has um, argued that uh, Pauling and Neal's uh, watershed moment uh, inaugurated what was the molecularization of disease. Uh, from before this, we thought of disease mainly in terms of germs and other things. After Pauling and Neal, increasingly disease came to be imagined through various uh, molecular mechanisms of DNA, aberrant DNA, genetic inheritance, et cetera, et cetera. So this inaugurated that moment that we are still living through. Uh, it also helped solidify and create a stable basis for distinguishing between uh, a trait um, and the disease itself. So when you have the sickle cell trait in today's science, we, we would explain that by saying that you have only one of the genes that are required. So each person has two genes, one they inherit from their father, one from their mother, and together the two produces a uh, uh, phenotype, uh, whatever, a physical expression in its most simple form. It's more complicated than that, but in its more simple, most simple form, that's what it ha uh, happens. Now, in the case of uh, sickle cell, when you get just one of those genes from one of the parents, you don't actually get the disease of sicklemia or sickle uh, anemia, what you, but your blood cells still stack up uh, differently and look different. So that is, so there are a lot of people who just, who don't have any physical symptoms. They themselves don't suffer at all, but their blood looks different uh, in a laboratory. So this is something that in the 19th century, people wouldn't have noticed. These were perfectly uh, healthy people. But once you have the test, these people from the 1910s and 20s, they started being clubbed together with people who were actually suffering from severe anemia. Um, but what uh, Pauling and Neil does is they once again open up this difference between having a trait that is having one gene and having the actual disease, which is when you have both the genes and you, you actually get the anemia. Anyway, mo uh, moving further forward in 1954, Anthony Allison, another uh, researcher, uh, discovered that having one of the sickle cell genes, that means if you have the trait, you actually have a partial immunity to severe cases of malaria, particularly cerebral malaria, which can be deadly. So um, this then together, the uh, Linus Pauling and Neil's, uh, J.V. Neal's discovery, together with Anthony Allison's discovery from the 1950s onwards, dramatically changes the discourse around sickle cell and race in the US. Instead of showing it to be a kind of marker of racial backwardness of African-Americans. Environmentalist uh, explanations now come to the fore. People start arguing that Africans developed these because they came from heavily malarious areas in Africa. And this was actually nature's way of protecting them. Uh, 
In fact, some people go further and say, contrary to the Jim Crow logic, we should actually allow uh, intermarriage and promote intermarriage because that would uh, permit this kind of, um, that would reduce the chances of uh, uh, a child getting two genes, but even better, it would actually spread the protection from malaria to the white population as well. So it could actually give, uh, it could be a beneficial thing to intermarry with African-Americans who have this gene and then um, develop this uh, protection. And this would particularly be useful in the US South where there is there was a lot of malaria still at that point. So anyway, that's the story we know. Now, coming to India, the Indian story is not written about at all. Most of the sickle cell anemia literature just looks at the US and, the, and Africa and almost ignores India. Um, but uh, if you look at the data nowadays, uh, any kind of global dispersion map will show you that uh, in many parts of India, particularly in middle India, uh, this gene has now been found extensively. The Indian discovery happens in January 1952, uh, where Herman Lehman and Murray Cutbush, uh, both uh, British researchers at this point, discover sickling uh, in a patient, again, the trait, this is not the disease, it's the trait that is discovered in a, uh, so I can't even call the people patients in whom they're discovered. So it's discovered in an individual uh, who worked as a fourth grade staff at the Pasteur Institute in Kunnur um, in Southern India. Lehman himself was interested in it because he was a Holocaust refugee. He was a Jewish doctor who had escaped to Britain and worked at St. Bart's in London. And he was interested in explaining why sickle cell genes were increasingly being found in Yemeni Jews. So after the Second World War, of course, the state of Israel um, uh, comes into being in 1948, um, 47, 48. And, um, this leads to a lot of Jews from all over the world moving to Israel. These are not just European Jews. A lot of so-called Oriental Jews or the Mizrahim uh, also um, move to Israel. And there's internal racial conflict develops uh, within uh, Israel. That I don't have time to go into that story, but Yemeni Jews are often at the, um, at the uh, receiving end of this uh, politics and they get framed negatively partly because they have, uh, they seem to have sickle cell in their blood and it is therefore thought to be a result of inter intermixture with black Africans, um, something that the European Jewry that's moving to Israel does not like. Now, Lehman wants to push back against this by saying that no, no, Yemeni Jews could have got it from elsewhere. He looks to India as a source of this, um, this sickle cell gene that got into the Jewish communities. Uh, he's also convinced that Jews are a separate race. Where could they have picked it up? They might have picked it up in India. Uh, he thinks of India because during the Second World War, he actually volunteers for service in the Royal Air Force and is posted in India. So he comes back after the war in 52 with Marie Katbush and he, um, he wants to research in India because there are the Pasteur Institute networks are also colonial institutions. He comes there to Kunnur. There he is helped by a lab technician called uh, PK Sukumaran, uh, whom you see here with uh, Toda uh, tribal community leaders in the Nilgiris here. Uh, Sukumaran is the man with the specs, uh, second from the left. Uh, so, Sukumaran um, helps um, Lehman uh, and he basically what he does is he lines up all the employees of the Pasteur Institute and has them give blood. And in one of these employees, uh, Lehman discovers sickle cell and that's his eureka moment. This person is never named, the individual in whose blood it was found, but and his caste is not initially discussed, but later on, uh, he is called a Badaga man. Uh, Badaga is being a small Nilgiri community, a tribal community as the, the tribal within quotes, of course. Now, at this moment, something else is also happening. There's a global part of this story. Uh, that is the move of genetics away from eugenics to medical genetics. As you no doubt know already that um, after the uh, defeat of the Nazis in the Second World War, uh, 
everything that was associated with Nazism got very bad press, not necessarily because other people weren't doing the same things, but because it was now associated with this demonized power that had lost. Uh, not, I mean, they were terrible in themselves, but it was also um, interesting that many of the victorious powers were also into eugenics in a very deep way. So they did also have communities of scientists who were doing genetic research, and these were all doing eugenics. But after the war, eugenics, because it seemed to be Nazi science, becomes difficult to sustain. Instead, what happens then is uh, geneticists then start arguing that their science should be allowed to continue and not shut down because they could also be a force for the good, for human good. How could they do this? Well, they could do this by developing medical applications. And they make this argument basically on a very important stage on something called UN SCIAR or the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. This committee was set up in the wake of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the Americans, uh, which of course led to an enormous human cost. Uh, but this committee was then set up to uh, because many scientists felt that the atom bomb had shown the destructive worst that modern science could produce, and they needed to do something to show that science could also be good. Initially, the committee was dominated by physicists, but gradually geneticists got hold of the committee and they started saying that it is they who should be given the responsibility of studying the long-term impact of radiation on the Hibakusha or the Japanese survivors in, um, in uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Uh, so this committee plays a very important role. It reformats and in some ways whitewashes genetics for a new future in the post-war world. They partly do this by recoding race as population. So after this, um, scientists become less likely to use the word race. They use population, though often in very similar ways. Uh, but the te technically, they insist that whereas race was about essential characteristics, population is only about frequencies, the frequency with which some trait appears in one group or another. The shift from race to population is never quite complete. Uh, even today, they are difficult to disentangle, even though nowadays in official publications, you're very rarely going to see the word race, where scientists more often use population. But if you get into it, if you look at how they work in the labs, um, there is still a lot of fuzziness between these two concepts. Anyway, more coming back to Sukumaran's um, story, Sukumaran himself is an interesting man. He's a high school dropout who ran away from home without finishing school, bummed around in various places, did various bit part jobs, eventually got a job as a gardener's assistant at the Pasteur Institute, impressed his seniors and became a lab technician. He had no scientific qualifications. His big moment was helping uh, Lehman with his discovery. After that, Lehman is really impressed by this young man, uh, young dynamic man. Uh, and Sukumaran starts calling Lehman his guru. Lehman tutors and mentors Sukumaran. Sukumaran becomes a researcher in his own right, still without any degrees whatsoever. In 1956, he leaves the Pasteur Institute's lowly lab technician job, joins the uh, newly formed Human Variation Unit uh, at the Indian Cancer Research Center in Bombay, now the Tata Memorial Center. Um, and, <clears throat> and there he begins to collaborate with some of the biggest, best known scientists in India at that time, including this gentleman, L.D. Sangvi. Sangvi is, is one of the foremost scientists of post-colonial India, born in the fateful town of Morbi, which has been in the news for the bridge collapse nowadays. Um, uh, he moved to Bombay at a young age. He was interested in maths initially, uh, but gradually got interested in mathematical computation of uh, human genetics went uh, to Columbia for a PhD after finishing his master's at Bombay University. At Columbia, he worked with the probably the best known geneticist at that time, uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky. Um, his committee was like a who's who of the top geneticists of the day, his PhD committee. Uh, having finished, he became the scientific secretary of UN SCIAR, the big committee that I was mentioning. So this was a very, very prominent scientist. He comes back to India, one of the things he starts doing when he comes back to India is he says that the Indian caste system gives us an ideal object for genetic research because these castes are perfectly endogamous. Uh, they 
breed only amongst themselves. And so you can work out difficult problems uh, in genetics over multiple generations through mathematical formulations, which otherwise would have to be done with fruit flies, a very simple uh, organism with only four chromosomes that there are difficulties in scaling up the uh, results you get with fruit flies, which is the most popular, um, most popular kind of um, this thing, model organism that geneticists, geneticists used at that time. So Sanghi starts saying, well, come to India. India is great because here we have these uh, endogamous uh, caste groups and you can do, you can actually answer these questions with humans rather than fruit flies. And it is Sangvi, because of his international stature, who also puts genetics and India on the genetic global map. And Sukumaran becomes his close collaborator and colleague at the center. They work together till the for the rest of both of their lives. One of the hypotheses they develop around sickle cell is when they start seeing that it's not just a Badaga gene. The gene is found in other groups, other communities um, throughout central India and the Nilgiris. Yet they keep insisting, they have to reconcile uh, Sangvi's insistence that every caste and every community, every religious community in India is perfectly endogamous, which is of course a fiction. And I can go into this later if you want, why it's a fiction. Uh, recently, Durba Mitro has written very uh, eloquently about the invention of endogamy as a concept. Uh, but geneticists take this up and particularly Sangvi is so invested in defending the alleged perfect millennia long in endogamy of Indian communities. How do you then reconcile the fact that here you have perfectly siloed communities, but you also have this gene available in practically all the communities in this region? Well, so he starts arguing for what I call a hydraulic model. He says that communities are perfectly endogamous, but there are these mobile groups who are sexually promiscuous and they pick up the gene and sometimes pass them on. Um, and this is how it has spread. And he basically singles out Banjaras and the Mahars uh, as, um, and the Mahars are of course a large lower caste community in Western India, but also becoming pretty politically assertive at this point. This is the com community that Dr. B. R. Ambedkar uh, belonged to, he was a Mahar. So, uh, so they, uh, Sangvi and Sukumaran start proposing Mahars and Banjaras as uh, these high, uh, communities, particularly Mahars who, uh, who move the gene around. Repeated arguments are therefore made uh, that counsel Mahar couples to marry but not have children. Sangvi also goes on All India Radio and gives long, hour long lectures, uh, reminding people of their duty to the nation and therefore not to reproduce their faulty genes which in this case also means Mahar's not having more children, which has of course obvious political uh, repercussions. And here I've got two tables. The one on top is from one of Sangvi's publications. The one at the bottom is from a 2017 publication. And you can see this, this kind of data collection, this kind of argument is, I mean, nobody in 2017 is saying that Mahar's should not have children, but that they are mainly a population that has a disproportionately high number of, um, of sickle cell cases is still being uh, scientifically observed and reproduced and they're being in a way framed just as African-Americans were in the US as being the community that uh, is somehow diseased. Now, moving very quickly to, because I'm running out of time to uh, my uh, interchapters. Now, the interchapters, as I said, they are kind of fictional. They they draw on an archive of fiction and they also fictionalize themselves. Now, what do we see in this fictional uh, archive? Um, well, I turn to Hemendra Kumar Rai's uh, Uber, not just his, um, his science fiction novel that I mentioned, but he wrote other kinds of what would today be called Gothic fiction, perhaps. Uh, one of his short stories is called Mrs. Kumudini Choudhury. It tells the story of a Christian widow uh, living amidst a tribal community in Chota Nagpur, where anemia seems to be strangely anemia and malaria are on the rise. Doctors are confounded, but it later transpires that uh, Mrs. Choudhury is actually a zombie uh, and a vampire. She rises from the grave and she sucks the blood out of people and therefore their blood counts go down. So anemia in a popular understanding is understood as 
um, the depletion of blood, which is not untrue in a certain way, uh, the depletion of blood. And that, of course, is then connected to vampirism. Um, interestingly, it would be tempting given today's, um, today's intellectual climate, many people want to argue often for indigenous knowledge, something uh, specifically um, Indian about this belief in vampires, etc. However, if you look a little deeper, it turns out that Hemingway's story itself was based on a story by the British writer E.F. Benson called Mrs. Amsworth, where the story had been set in Rawalpindi um, and the vampire was a uh, English woman in the colonies uh, who had gone through several husbands. Um, the political resonances are somewhat different. Benson was a, a, a gay author in early 20th century Britain, but also very elite who looked down on some of the uh, practices in the colonies. Um, and was there was also a strain of misogyny in his writings, whereas in uh, Hemendra uh, Kumar's writings, uh, there is probably an element of uh, anti-Christian sentiment, particularly around uh, tribal communities. But that being said, this is also, this kind of understanding is also circulating on a global and modern circuit. So the fact that Ray is, uh, basing his plot on Benson's story shows that there's nothing authentically Indian about this. The science fiction provides an orthogonal archive, but one that is equally modern and that's equally global that comes at these very issues of race and society and social predation uh, from a different angle. So uh, in conclusion then, a rather untidy conclusion, I'm sorry, for that, um, uh, hopefully the book ties it back a little more. Uh, but in conclusion, racial thinking is not about being overtly racist. It's not people who are just racists who make racial assumptions. R the reinvention of biological arguments about caste in India has also reproduced race as risk factor. This is something that I talk about in the chapter, and again, I can talk in the Q&A. Uh, today, these studies that are done on Mahars and others is done in the name of uh, diagnosing risk, where you're no longer actually looking for disease, but you're looking at the risk of falling ill. Um, and this is what geneticization has allowed, but this in India is getting read into caste and religious divisions in interesting ways. Scientists themselves are also situated historical subjects. They interpret their data, uh, from within the historical context that they inhabit. And so that's what's been happening here. Um, so the reason that Sangvi thought and perfect caste endogamy was, uh, was plausible was partly a function of his historical location. Um, there are all kinds of extra scientific assumptions that enter into scientific interpretations of data. Why do the Mahars repeatedly get uh, framed as uh, a diseased community at this point. Science fiction, as I said, is an alternative archive that I don't think has been mined enough because we are so caught up in this new decolonial rhetoric of finding authentic indigenous knowledge, which I find highly problematic, I would confess, that it becomes uh, that we don't look at what, the, what other kinds of alternative archives, orthogonal archives exist. And I think of science fiction as a kind of orthogonal archive that often holds up a lens, maybe not a very clear lens, but an opaque lens to some of the social and political issues around science and modernity. Um, so I want to just leave you with this uh, visual at the bottom, which was published in Lancet um, earlier, um, or yeah, it was actually published, I think, uh, late last year in 2021, which looked at how different it says impact on linguistic and genetic isolates of India, but if you read it, it's once again about caste, how different um, different caste communities in India and religious communities have apparently different levels of risk and immunity to COVID. Uh, so this kind of research continues. It continues in the name of serving uh, medicine and providing better healthcare. So thank you for listening to me and maybe I should just stop sharing and turn it over to Rena.
Well, thank you so much, Project. That was that was scintillating. I mean, I, I learned so much and I have so many different questions and uh, I, I want to make sure that we have enough time for Q&A. And so, you know, for all of you, I know that most of your videos are off, which is completely understandable, but, you know, please feel free to just raise your hand. Um, you know, Zara did a clapping icon, so you can just do the raise hand icon and I'd be happy to call on you. If you prefer not to, you know, articulate your question, uh, but would like to type it into the chat I'm happy to read it out for you but um but you know as we kind of begin to get people to reflect and and hopefully engage I had a I had a kind of few responses really more than questions uh project but and I guess one of them is a question um one of them is a clarification question so I mean I've like like this is why I love historians, right? Like it's so wild to me that in, and please tell me if I've got the decade wrong, but that in the 1960s, you could have an all India broadcast in which a, a doctor, right? A state, uh, I mean, an authority, I'm going to say, I, I, words kind of, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what words to use, is actually on all India radio, encouraging or or pleading or, or you know, basically, blaming certain castes for spreading certain genetic kind of blueprints and actually asking them not to bear children. And so, of course, as a political scientist, um, I have all kinds of questions about the state and the body and about sterilization campaigns that are happening at the same time and kind of, you know, broad questions about the state and the body and the state and health. And of course, I know you come from the subaltern study school. So this idea of, you know, the colonization of the body that people have argued for under British colonial rule, but what is the post-colonial democratic Indian state doing? But a, a prelude to that question was just a clarification. So in your history of the kind of, um, you know, sickle cell anemia in the US, you said that at some point after the kind of Nobel Prize, it went and, and please correct me if, my, if I misunderstood. So rather than being seen as a marker of kind of debilitation, it began to be seen as a sign almost of protection, right? That having the sickle cell actually protected you from malaria and that there was even this move to encourage African-Americans to kind of, you know, um, spread this gene to white populations that might protect them from malaria. So I'm just trying to thread the needle. Had that memo not reached India? Like, is there a way in which, like, why could it not be the case that given that malaria is one of the highest causes of mortality and, you know, remains such a huge disease, why would it not be that the Mahars and the Banjaras would potentially, like the African Americans, be encouraged to intermarry with other caste groups uh, in order to kind of, in a way, spread this protection against malaria. So that was just a kind of clarifying question. Maybe, um, and then the broader question was, you know, what is the state doing um, as regards health? more broadly and how are those discourses about genetics and family you know also the family planning the us is so big at this point of time through the ford foundation in india in terms of kind of pushing forward this this malthusian nightmare so you know where does all of this the kind of going on all india radio and asking mahars not to have kids um and you know and the other kind of um, the other state kind of policies and, and, you know, where does the anthropological survey come in? So that was just about the state and disease and health. But I also just had this clarification question about, um, about the gene and, and kind of protection from malaria. Thank you, Prerna. Those are both excellent questions and allow me to uh, expand a bit on, uh, on some of these things. So, you know, the, um, the argument that is made for why the same thing is not true in India. Why does like intermarrying with Mahars not give other people other non-Mahars protection as well? Is that Sanfi and others keep arguing that you know this might have had a positive valence when malaria could not be cured, but now we have quinine. Why do we even need to uh, protect it? So, so there are. This is actually explicitly mentioned in. The, I think it is actually mentioned in the. AIR broadcast that I mentioned as well, but it's definitely mentioned in other papers where it said that the uh, the whatever environmental advantage had accrued due to having this gene was, has now been um, uh, rendered redundant because of advances in medical science, which can cure malaria anyways. 
So they nullify whatever. So that's a really telling difference because that argument, which you will still hear in certain African-American circles in the US where sickle cell still comes up and often it is given this positive spin by saying, oh, but you know, it developed, it's actually a good thing. It developed because it gives you protection to malaria. But in India, that discourse never takes off because it's like, we've got a better technocracy that sorted out malaria. So this is a useless uh, thing in your genetic inheritance, get rid of it now. The other thing is um, that it also, I think, draws attention to how the way that science is both global and local in the 21st century. Uh, to, I know that's a little trite to just say that, but it's how one part of it circulates and another part of it doesn't. So, uh, so the fact that after the Nobel Prize, after this molecularization of disease, et cetera, that this is actually a race busting uh, development in the US that undermines this kind of insular idea of races. In India, it is actually used to reinforce this kind of racial siloing. So it's interesting that that disjunct and that I think draws attention precisely to no matter what the science is, you can see how it will always play out in particular contexts in a different way. Um, your second question about 60s, yes, you're right. The uh, broadcast was in the 60s. Um, and this is directly connected to some of the sterilization things uh, because you also have um, people like, and I think there's a connection with all these people be being based in, or at least the medical. So, you know, in my book, geographically, much of it, the ASI story is very Calcutta centric because the ASI is still headquartered in Calcutta. And a lot of the scientists who work there are in Calcutta. The medical side of the story is very Bombay centric because uh, it's mainly these guys were, because genetics essentially is Sangvi and his original um, master's uh, thesis supervisor, VR Kanolkar, they're based at the Tata Institute. And so it's the Tata network that promotes it. And so, in Bombay presidency, particularly, you have the socialists. So somebody like Shakuntala Paranjpe, Sai Paranjpe's mother, uh, who was a socialist MP in parliament, she was arguing, she actually proposed a bill for the forcible sterilization of uh, people who had certain kinds of diseases, including things like leprosy, TB. Um, she didn't include malaria, but I think she the bill was capacious enough that it got defeated. And I think that's where the power of that democracy was in the 60s, which maybe the, today it would have got passed, uh, that, uh, that it was in the 60s, it's the political, but there is this kind of, there's a progressive group in Bombay and Pune that are very invested in a certain kind of medical eugenics. And I think that's what's allowing it to, I also don't know what kind of vernacular propaganda was happening though, because this broadcast on AIR was in English. So I don't know what its reach was at that time, but I don't know what was happening in Marathi. Yeah, I think it's just so super interesting. And we have uh, questions in the chat, so I'll turn it over. But to me, you know, what I, as political scientists, we sometimes think that our role comes in after independence. And there's this complete like disjuncture, like 1947 is this like, you know, colonial state and then this post-colonial democratic state. And to me, of course, the really interesting thing, especially when you study things like public health is the kind of enormous continuity. And sometimes as you're saying, these kinds of things that it's very hard to grapple with, like socialist members of parliament bringing forth these kinds of bills, but also what the Nehruvian state um, is doing what is being broadcast on All India Radio. But I think this point that you mentioned between English and the vernacular is also uh, really interesting. I have been looking in, in my work at these uh, journals that were published uh, called Kurukshetra, which is, of course, an interesting name, um, and mm -hmm. Yojana, which were meant to kind of really educate the frontline service providers, the village level workers, and even just seeing, um, you know, their discourse of what should be happening around public health in village India is is a very parallel story to yours, but right. I don't want to take up any more space and just open up the floor. And we have Ashish with the question. Ashish, if you just wanted to unmute yourself or put on your video. Um, and after that, I have Rita. Thanks. Um, so my question is actually similar to Rita's. Um, so one is that, so I understand that some people who study modern Ashish, I think we lost you. Sorry, can you hear me? We can. Uh, Ashish, could you also just introduce yourself a bit, please? My name is 
I'm a postdoc at Harvard, I'm a demographer. So one question is that modern, I understand that a stream within modern history of India wants to talk about how caste courts gets reified or, uh, I mean, their versions of this gets reified or created or uh, solidified during colonial rule. And then there is sort of the genetic evidence which sort of, for instance, to, uh, as uh, David Wright's book or Tony Godian's book talks about the long history of 2000 years of endogamy, right? As someone who's not from this field, from either of these two fields, genetics or from, or from sort of modern history, my view is to let this conversation continue, right? And so we learn something about it as we go on. You have sort of a critique of the genetic studies of caste. So I want to know more about why you have a stronger critique than this. Oh, let's let science continue. I understand that the genetic community and eugenics is really screwed up in the past. Why should they be, why should current science be limited by failures in the past? Okay. Okay, great. That's a good, very good question. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I would say that I have I have neither the power nor the interest in saying that science should not continue. May they continue and produce more quackery so that I can study them. So, <laughs> so uh, no, I'm not. I'm just being partly facetious here. But uh, obviously, I mean, to study something is to not say that it shouldn't happen. And I don't think I've. I what I was trying to show was that the politics did not necessarily always line up with what we think of as progressive politics or, or regressive politics or conservative politics, whatever. Now, as far as the contemporary studies go, I will say that we need to, and there are people studying it. So uh, there's, um, uh, there's a very good anthropologist, Yulia Egerova, who studied David Reich and his findings and also how they are playing out in the vernacular uh, media in various um, various Hindi newspapers, for instance. So, you know, these studies are not politically neutral. There, no science is politically neutral. That's my point. So you have to understand the uh, politics of it, but does understanding the politics mean that banning it? No, I, and even if I thought it should be banned, I won't have the authority to ban it. Second thing is um, that, there is a uh, studies show that endogamy prevailed over 2000 years. No, no, they don't show endogamy prevailed. They make certain assumptions about endogamy. So if you look at the science, if you actually unpack the science, how it is done, you will see there are assumptions being made. There, there are certain parts of a DNA that are being analyzed today. And if those uh, bits have remained unchanged, then certain mathematical models are used to see where they varied from. And what we, what I'm saying is that we have this knee-jerk reaction that either science is good or science is bad. We need to unpack it. The science, like everything else, has a lot of politics baked into it. We need to understand what kind of assumptions are being made. If you look at endogamy, we have for the better part of the uh, 20th century, uh, social anthropologists have been showing that the caste groupings are, you know, they're not, not to say that caste was invented or not invented in, by the colonial uh, state. That's, I think, a red herring. But that this kind of endogamy, even if you believe that caste existed, is never possible. It's which community has ever lived next to another community for any length of time and you, people have not slept with each other and have had babies with each other. It, it's just never happened. Similar assumptions, similar arguments have been made about Jewish communities, for instance. They've been made about all kinds of other communities. The construction of what is an isolate is as much a social phenomena as it is a fact. There is, it's not as if it's just out there. There are, we construct this by making certain assumptions. Now those assumptions are even who gets included, what part of the DNA is getting examined. So we need to just unpack, we need to understand more of the science instead of saying that science is right or wrong. So I don't know if that uh, answers to you to your satisfaction, Ashish, but thanks for the question. Yeah, we have an endorsement from the chat, so Ashish is satisfied. Thanks for that question, okay. Ashish. Uh, I have next uh, Rita and then a postdoc at the Watson Institute at Brown, uh, who also works on these issues, an anthropologist, Zehra Hashmi. So Rita first and then Zehra. Um, hi, uh, I did put my question in the chat. Um, so I think maybe partially it was answered, but I just wanted to find out uh, uh, how does he 
react to this idea of the 11 founding families. I think that was the number, maybe 11 or 12 that the David Reich uh, research and others have argued or found. Um, you know, I found that whole idea of 11 founding families very fascinating. And so if you can comment on that. You're and, a Sorry, Rita, if you could just introduce yourself um, for yes. the rest of us. Sorry, yes, I'm a resident scholar at American University. Great, thank you, and thank you for your question. Thank you, and uh, yeah, you're right. My answer is very similar to what I gave Ashish, uh, that I'm, I'm in no position, I'm not a geneticist, I'm not gonna say whether David Reich is correct or uh, incorrect. What I will say is that it's an interesting historical fact for me, that in the second decade of the 21st century, a person like David Reich is making certain assumptions that wants to, that thinks that on the basis of looking at blood. So for instance, in when I was a undergrad in the 1990s, people usually look to archeology span uh, or linguistics to answer questions about ancient India. Now we are looking to geneticists. So there's an interesting history to be told even there of what kind of science, is authoritative enough to comment about the past. You can go even further back and then, or even now to you can look to certain, maybe more uh, devout religious people who will say that I don't need the science, my whatever my religious scripture is telling me what is true or what is untrue. So to me, it is a social fact that the genetics has now become an authorized uh, site from which claims about uh, Indians past and India's current diversity are being made, firstly. Secondly, again, uh, this is not unique to India. For instance, if you look at Jewish genetics, now it's being said that originally there were three uh, European women from whom all Jews are descended because they have something called halakhic um, inheritance where uh, Jewishness passes through the mother. So they've now narrowed it down to apparently just three women somewhere in Ukraine or Poland from whom everybody is descended. So these kind of arguments, they are functioning within their, they have, they play out within a political spectrum that those claims are translated and expanded on for uh, to further various political ends. And they're not always bad ends. Some of it is also progressive. Um, like Tony Joseph's book, for instance, was is quite a progressive, politically progressive book. So all kinds of political claims are made, but we think now that the way to make those claims is through genetics, or and we uh, defer to some geneticists. And if you look at some of David Reich's, you know, the other uh, one last point I will say, in this tra transition from you know to genetics, one of the things that's happened is that the sample sizes have shrunken enormously. There was a time even in the mid 20th century when people were be beginning to use statistical methods in anthropometric measurements. The critique was often your sample size is too small. With geneticists, their sample sizes are sometimes like David Reich's, one of his early studies had only 130 people from whom DNA had been extracted. But on the basis of that, he was saying he can, uh, say things. There was, I read some other studies where apparently they found a Brahmin gene uh, in which was, which had the highest density incidentally in Kashmir, but only 35% of even the Kashmiri pundits had that gene. Then how is that a Brahmin gene? So either you say that the others are not really Brahmins, which is same thing happens here with Jews. You say that then those people are later converts. They're not really Jews, but it goes back to like, if you had sampled them, you would have come up with a different bracket and different category. Uh, so yeah, again, I don't know, maybe the answer was a little all over the place, but thanks for your question. Yeah, no, it reminds me, you know, um, I, I always read this article by Joseph Heinrich uh, at Harvard, you know, it's called weird. And this idea that all the assumptions we know, assumptions we have about human behavior are from Western educated, industrialized, uh, W-E-I-R, someone else can help me in this, um, democracies, I think. And so basically the idea that all the psychology tests have been done on undergraduate populations. So everything that we know about how humans behave comes from samples of like, you know, 18 to 22, 23 year olds um, in kind of basically these weird countries. And so, you know, everything that we know about human reciprocity, generosity, you know, in all these games is basically from this one sample. So so I, I not so much that the answer was all over the place, Project, but I think it's analogous 
analogous to this idea that you know who you sample in some ways uh, makes a huge difference for the kind of theory that you generate. Uh, so absolutely, actually, actually, Prerna, that maybe there's a better way of framing this answer. And my favorite example of that kind of thing is that for a very long time, human brain atlases. So when humans do brain imaging, they refer to an atlas to see if there's an abnormality. All the human brain at atlases were based on the brain picture of one 65 or 68 year old French woman. So her brain was the norm for all of us. Now they've gone beyond that and they've done like real time. So there are digital atlases which are constantly being updated. But again, it depends on which countries are linked to that atlas, what your internet upload speeds are, who has a brain brain imaging re registry, which spaces have that. So eventually, you know, one way of answering this question is every science is about making a general claim based on a very specific experiment uh, that you carry out in one lab. Now, when you generalize, there's always that question is going to come in of like, what were the specificities of the sample? And how did you, how valid is the generalization? So I think maybe that might be a more like acceptable frame. No, no, absolutely. And I just remember what the R in the weird is. Western educated, industrialized, rich democracies. So that's apparently where right. we all know. Yeah, okay, right. so I'm going to stop and turn it over first to Zehra and then to Marianne. So Zehra, um, if you wanted to unmute yourself, then. Hi. Hello. Thank you Hi, so Sarah. much. Hi, how are you? This is so fantastic. I'm so excited to read this book. I mean, I have a lot of comments about why exactly I'm, I'm so excited about it. But um, one of them, of course, is that I think you're what's really helpful for those of us who are especially working on the post-colonial is to see that you're thinking of the way that all of this stuff is not just coming from an external place of white supremacist anthropology, et cetera, et cetera, but they're all of these, um, yeah, really important institutional uh, formations that are producing this knowledge from within South Asia. So I have a question that's, to put it, to simplify it, it's really about the relationship between race and caste and how you're thinking of uh, caste as sort of this caste thinking is also racialized thinking. So here I'm thinking, you know, in the Anthro 101 sort of stuff that we teach in anthropology, I remember this moment of like trying to explain to the undergrads that race is real because it's like a social political thing, but it's also made up because of all of these reasons. And then this move to population and I was trained in a four field department with biological anthropologists. So we have a lot of conversations with them and this move to population is very clear. But the main point is that it's human variation. So there are only like a couple of adaptive differences that we have, I think lung capacity, things like that, are, that's one of them. But that it's about environmental difference, right? So here I'm thinking about, well, how do they, like how do the people that you speak about think about environmental variation when they're thinking of caste because on one hand yes in terms of the social categories and even self-identification or identification of others we have a really clear parallel between say African Americans and Mahars in the case that you tell us but on the other hand in terms of that kind of wide migration and um invite those maps that you you know you see of variation across the globe and over time uh across racial uh, racial composition and and diseases etc and adaptation you have a different kind of thing going on with caste in south asia um so i was wondering yeah if you can speak to you know how how they're thinking of that and then i guess the other question is you know you've told us about caste and caste endogamy, but it really brought up a lot of questions for me around the way that people talk about cousin marriage in Muslim societies and whether that was something that came up. I mean, of course, that's also environmental. I'm not trying to goad about India's defeat, but, you know, Pakistan and the fast bowlers and meat eating and or this whole idea. And it's like, obviously not just that, but, um, you know, th there's there's this kind of weird mix up that happens with the assumptions that that go into it. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if you can if you can speak to to both of those. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, let me, let me, there are, I think there are four things that I want to address in your uh, question. The so the first one, the relationship between race and caste. I think one of the things that happened with this seroanthropological take and this geneticization of, um, of race is that uh, 
what you have as 19th century race are they're going to be like five or seven. So if you look at H.H. H. Risley and people like that, uh, there are five or seven primordial races. Everything else is a mix of those races. What you get once you get into genetics is this idea that any group, so races can come into being and races can disappear as well. They are essentially segregated gene pools that are reproductively isolated from everybody else. Now, this happens in, and the what that does is it shortens the temporal duration for race formation into a historical time. So instead of thinking that, oh, it's like some time in like way beyond any human imagination that it took three millennia for this race to form or whatever, it says that even 200 years of like, you know, Pitcairn Islanders become a favored object of genetic studies. Pitcairn Islanders are the descendants of the HMS Bounty Rebellion or mutiny, the famous mutiny on the bounty. So those guys marry Tahitian women and or have children with them. And that group becomes a great uh, favored object that lots of genetic studies are done because they've become a separate race. And that's like how many years? That's mid early 19th century. And so just uh, so the time required for the coming into being of a race is greatly foreshortened. And that I think allows caste, particularly with caste, you know, there's always this problem with uh, the English word caste does not actually map in onto any kind of social formation. It's like that jati, varna, but all these jatis and with jatis, we also know once you get into it, you know that jatis are historical. They can, they can be formed because of various uh, like occupational changes or whatever, but even that can, all that argument can now be accommodated and they can still be a race. So that is an interesting mutation to the idea of race that happens. And I think a lot of us still struggle because we have a 19th century idea of race. We think race is one thing, but race itself has a history. Race has meant different things at different points. So when a guy in 1960s, India is using the word race in this kind of a study, he's using it very differently from Risley. Even though there's a continuity, they keep citing Risley. That's another story. Um, about environment, your other question, I would say that, okay, um, you know, I, I'm not very convinced that environment is a great progress on anti-racial thinking. There's, there's a, uh, so you see this, uh, for instance, there's uh, a very interesting book on uh, diabetes in the Mexican community. And it's like, you know, it looks at how you, when you, for some reason, progressives think that if you say it's not about Mexican inheritance, but only their diet, then it is fine. Then it's not racial anymore. We see the same thing. There's another really good study on South Asian uh, Britons, like British Asians, uh, that again, progressives will never say that South Asians are diabetic. They'll say, but they have too much rice. That's the problem. Or uh, they have too much oil in their diet. But that's still coda for a certain kind of racialization of a community. So I don't know whether there is a way in which environment is a big progress, particularly, I mean, diet is still something that you could tweak, but environment when it is used in this kind of a rhetoric, which is a multi-generational rhetoric. So it's saying that African-Americans are still bearing the traces of an allegedly primordial environment in Africa from where they were brought. So somehow you're like, and this is, um, this is uh, Suman Seth has a very interesting book on 18th century and how the idea of race changes with this kind of migra forced migration as well, and which offers some thoughts on this, which is quite interesting. Uh, and one of the things he says is that the way to detect what is racial and what is not is to see where is the causal arrow going? Like is the causal arrow leading from this person is black because his soul is black or because he's black, his soul is black? So it's it's uh, so kind of when character are characteristics explaining your biology or is biology explaining your characteristics? Uh, then uh, this issue of you know de not looking for decolonial and the, seeing this as this is not all coming from uh, imperial. That is I feel very strongly about that. I think that is you know we have embraced this the politics and the language in American academia is often developed with political struggles of the Americas in mind, where indigenous communities, where you're talking, when you talk of decolonial, you're basically talking of indigenous communities, which are very small scale, extremely um, disadvantaged, politically marginalized, and to talk about their authenticity to decolonize, et cetera, et cetera. And 
to search for some kind of pure, authentic, like non-colonial epistemology or cosmology is fine. I, I'm totally on board with that project. When you're talking about majoritarian uh, Asian democracies like Indian and India and China, where authentic non-colonial is the space that the right occupies, I find it highly problematic. So I, I want to say that the problem now is not so much decolonial, we need denational. This is my pet peeve. I was at a round table in Madison and I was saying the same thing that we need. Decolonial might be fine if you're an American academic. I am based in Delhi. For me, I need denational. <laughs> my problem is nationalism today. It's not, colonialism was a problem for my grandfather. For me, my problem is nationalism. So, uh, and then finally, the cross cousin marriage thing, that is huge. Sangvi writes a ton about that. And uh, it's not just Muslim communities. It's also all the um, so-called Dravidian communities, because Tamils, um, Kannadas, various castes, they all have cross cousin marriage. So consanguineous marriage is a huge thing and it's demonized no end. That's also something that they're trying to stop through public health propaganda. So the state really wants to intervene there and they're much more happy to intervene there. Again, the kind of normative family type that is assumed is because again, 19th century Indian anthropology is in or colonial anthropology is Indian inheritance thinks that there are three kinship systems in South Asia, the North Indian, one, the South Indian one, and then there's the Western Indian one, which is a bit of a mix of both. And the main, one of the main distinguishing features is North Indians don't have cross cousin marriages, South Indians have cross cousin marriages. So it's, it's both Muslims, but it's also this kind of like making the North normative. So that's also going on. So, but there's a ton on that. <laughs> Yeah, super exciting. So we have two more questions, at least. Um, so I want to kind of, you know, uh, open and call on on Marianne. One thing I would say, Projit, is that to me, the national and the colonial are linked. So if the problem is nationalism today, I still think that the content of that nationalism is still very much. So it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a post-colonial, it's a, it's a, post-colonial national, it's post-nationalism from that. So anyway, that's an ongoing conversation to be yeah, had, yeah, yeah. but I want to kind of open it up and maybe ask Marianne to introduce herself and then to ask her question. Sure, thank you so much, Puna. Uh, my name is Marjan Murdaki, um, and I'm a devout uh, follower of Prajit's work, of course, um, and I'm currently a postdoc at, at Yale. Um, and Prajit, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, I'm, I can't wait to read your book. And of course, I will send you a ton of questions and, and, and can't wait to, to do that. Um, but really, my question um, today is just pretty short and perhaps also a bit historiographically, but also perhaps even selfishly um, about um, you mentioning um, kind of your reservation or some of the problematics of, of doing indigenous knowledge. Um, and it seems to me that, and perhaps you already answered that with kind of pointing at the national projects. Um, but it seems to me that if we are doing uh, indigenous knowledge, um, particularly in a moment when we tend to kind of put barriers between kind of Western science and, and kind of South Asian knowledge traditions, or perhaps the only time we do tend to think about indigenous knowledge is through enchantment projects, right? Where we look at these ritualized um, processes that in those cases, it would be problematic um, to look at indigenous knowledge. But can you, um, again, I'm asking this really selfishly, what are some important ways when we should be talking about indigenous knowledge, particularly as, for instance, you and uh, Prina mentioned this idea of weird countries, right? Where things become, are so small and sample, shouldn't we be having more samples, so to speak? Um, I'll leave it at that. I hope it makes sense. Well, I'm okay, uh, nice to see you, Marjan. Uh that so to, I'll, I'll take that as two questions one is that the question of samples so you know one of the places where this kind of racialization is big time happening in india now is in 2005 india launched something called the indian genome variation database uh, that's being put together by the top uh, laboratories across india uh, to constitute the indian genome variation consortium mind you this is 2005 manmohan singh's government uh, not really the obnoxious government we have now. So, um, so again, but there's continuity. It's still being funded. It's being funded in a major way. And that part of their argument was that the in human genome project had not taken account of us. And now we are doing this. So there's a, 
there is a certain nationalist claim for like there's a nationalist let's say nationalist state appropriation of this need for more samples argument and that's then playing out in a kind of you know prerna was saying earlier of like what do we call these nationalist states there's is there a sort of internal colonization of the body that's going on and i think there is and uh, while i totally agree with also prerna's earlier comment that there is continuity with this nationalism or any nationalism is i think largely a product of nationalism of co uh, colonialism but i think also in the critiques we make the what words we use whom we are calling out now um because and then once we keep on there are so many types of colonialism i'm also i think we we really need to make a distinction between settler colonialism and the kind of colonialism we've had in asia um those have had very different consequences uh we can't be using the same language as they are using we need to be just as you know iberian colonialism is something quite different from the anglo french colonialism but this is even bigger for us because the post colonial is different the post colonial has resulted in majoritarian states which make claims about being non colonial in a way that sometimes prevents people like me from embracing words like indigenous i am very squeamish about the word indigenous i don't like it at all and i don't use it anywhere and that's partly because of you know because i'm i'm based in india i'm my uh, location this is my political fight so uh, i cannot embrace the word indigenous with as much equanimity should we not talk of alternatives because of that yes but again should we call it alternative so again um, so there was a time when Ashish Nandi famously wrote alternative science and wanted to find like the alternative through religious practices that are within the sort of uh, intellectual inheritance of particular scientists. I'm because he was writing what in the 90, early 1990s, and my context today is I don't want to do that again because the politics of the situation has changed. I want to intervene in a different way. i do want to that's why i brought in science fiction because science fiction to me is a good archive that provides a kind of um something that cannot be co-opted into a nationalist rhetoric but also often offers us a uh, orthogonal or a uh, tangential take on science and modernity so i go towards that kind of like cheap schlock <laughs> be that on film or, or in print uh, rather than trying to identify any kind of like authentic alternative um it yeah so i don't know whether that answers your question but thanks this Wait, is of course we just have uh, we just have a couple of minutes um project which is a probably an indicator of the amount of thought that your excellent talk has uh, generated but i want to give fazel uh, the last word fazel if you just wanted to unmute yourself uh, introduce yourself and ask your question that'd be great um sure maybe i'll skip my question and my might absorb the last 2 minutes and no why don't you might... ask it why don't you ask it let's oh, okay. have it on the record and then we can you know maybe we can leave just thinking about it okay so, um sure i'm i'm fasal chaudhry and i'm a legal scholar and historian um at umass in southern massachusetts in dartmouth um i was i was going to ask you project a little bit about your initial framing around um rebiologization and um i i'm guessing based on your kind of allusions to 19th century race science you would concede that there was never a moment of debiologization even if there was a re moment in other words mm -hmm. every age kind of gets its its own race science um so i i i guess what i would want to um i kind of ask for your thoughts on i guess this being the third monograph you're kind of um you know you know kind of giving us where are you at in terms of how you're thinking of kind of the ghost in this machine of science in that mm -hmm. you know if i i i grant that the scientific ideas are important the the ideas are important for giving us the race science that's diffusing into society but i think as even your kind of talk demonstrates the line is so porous and where the science is versus where the ideology or where the science is versus how it's getting taken up in the public sphere it's so porous that it it sometimes seems that i mean i mean, i guess maybe i'm thinking a little bit about bruno latour or certain phases of his career and his 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 passing but i'm i'm just wanting to ask where you are with regard to
keeping the category of science and how we think about this, because it, sometimes it seems like that generates more problems than it's worth. Because even if we're thinking about genetics, the, the contemporary revolution in genetics is so different than the kind of genetic science you're talking about. If you were maybe focusing on the global north rather than seroanthropology, the first thing that might come to mind with regard to genetics is even looking to an earlier period is, is you know, Mendel or, you know, all these other strands. And it, it, it just seems like the science part, whatever its content is, is so sort of loosely in a way connected to what is done with the quote unquote science that I'm just wondering maybe methodologically or theoretically or, or maybe even just as a glimpse into the subfield of the history of medicine or history of science, where, where do you feel like people are at with regard to the question of, of what to do with the category of science? And maybe a shorter way of asking that is, is there a state of the art or a state of the art in your own mind about the, the internalist versus externalist history of science tension? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Project, we're officially out of time, but I'm just gonna give you like a minute maybe, and that's a great question to end with. So thank sure. you so much, Vesel. Sure. And thank you, you know, for, for the talk, but maybe just like a, a minute less on just sure. kind of, you know, yeah, where are you at? So uh, thanks, Faisal, and great that you were able to ask all that while driving. So, uh, as I know, he's driving <laughs> today. So, uh, uh, my where I'm at is that I don't believe there is anything epistemically unique about science. I think there's a the, science exists as an actor's category constantly as something that is defined against non-science. I don't think there's any pure science that can be. Uh, scientific method. I mean, we've got very good uh, studies now that show how even the idea of scientific method is cooked up in textbooks in the 1930s. Uh, so there is, I don't think there is an internal as such, but what internal and external, the way that tension is playing out in history of science amongst professional historians of science now are those who look more towards like scientific practices and those who give more space to ideology. But I think that's like a bit of a, an, uh, false contradiction because that's not really uh, disputing the fact that there is no epistemic uniqueness to a thing called science. Uh, it's just a matter of how you organize your book, like how much do you, and you see that tension in my book as well. I've got one chapter where I'm really doing a deep dive into, um, into the actual laboratory practices, but the rest of it is um, at the level of ideology. And so some, the book could have been rewritten with more chapters on just like the actual laboratory practices and one framing chapter on ideology. So that's a question of choice, I think, but I, do, I don't know whether that, that satisfies you, but we should, we should definitely chat separately about this and other stuff sometime soon. Thank you so much, Projit. Um, this was this was great. It was thrilling. We can't wait, as I'm sure you can't wait to have a copy of your book in our hands. And thank you to all of you for joining. Um, you know, it is officially a, a kind of holiday here in uh, in America. And again, I think we passed uh, we passed a talk time in India. So thank you for joining, and thank you again for those of you who catch this uh, later. But thank you, really, Projit, and uh, good luck. And we can't wait to see what comes next. Thank you, Prerna. Thank you, everyone who's here. And thank you, Grace and Stephanie, um, who kind of make the Saxena Center run. So with that, um, goodbye. <laughs>